Good. Thank you all for coming. What a great turnout. I think they planned this event, what, 10 days ago? Yeah. And look what we've got. Thank you all for coming. John and I really wanted to come to LA uh, for this book. And, you know, thanks to all the people at the station who made this possible, or else we wouldn't be here. Thanks to all of you for being an audience. Uh, we're really proud of this book, uh, and you'll hear why right now. The book began, <laughs> <laughs> the book began uh, two years ago, uh, two and a half years ago at Davos, where the global elite meets every year to carve up the world. And uh, the keynote speaker then uh, was Eric Schmidt, the CEO of then Google, then CEO of then Google, now Alphabet. And Eric Schmidt, in his speech to the assembled masses at Davos in January 2014, said, I just want to alert you, friends, what's coming down the pike. Here at Google, we're working on some stuff, and some of our other companies uh, in the United States around the world uh, working in high technology are working on some stuff that's going to revolutionize employment with artificial intelligence and robotics and advances in computers. We're pretty much going to wipe out a large chunk of jobs that are in the economy. And he said, um, you know, he didn't give an exact percentage, but it sounded like a majority. He said, this is probably going to take place over the next 20 or 30 years. And with deft understatement, he said, this will probably be the biggest political issue of the period. <laughs> um, now, John caught wind of this first, and he uh, brought it to my attention. And we said, that's a very interesting point he's making. <laughs> no one seems to be talking about this very much. So we went and we sort of studied it. We went and looked at the engineering and business literature in this computer science literature. And we found out that indeed Eric Schmidt was not just spinning some BS. This is in fact a roundly accepted phenomenon in technology and business circles, and well understood now increasingly um, by people not in those circles as they see it come down the pike. And we of course then wonder, well, what exactly are the political implications of this? You know, what, uh, what's gonna happen if we have a society that's tending towards massive unemployment, much more so than we have now? And it clearly uh, is, to use the most banal, hackneyed cliche, a game changer, <laughs> to put it mildly. And at the same time as we were talking about this, we were both reading Naomi Klein's new book, This Changes Everything, which I think you're all familiar with, makes a very elegant argument about the importance of climate change. And so our working title for this, before people get ready, was This Changes Everything Else. <laughs> unemployment has a way of getting, poverty and hunger has a way of getting human beings' attention immediately. Like probably no other issue uh, imaginable. Now, also the other point, and Schmidt didn't go in this territory, but we do in the book, it's, this is hitting the world economy at probably the worst possible time. It's not like it's the capitalism's hitting on all cylinders right now. Massive unemployment, underemployment is the order of the day, really, for, for the most part, worldwide. Growing inequality, growing poverty, uh, all the austerity, and it's not just human beings who are unemployed. American businesses, U.S. corporations are sitting on $2 trillion in liquid cash. They can't invest. They're just not profitable investments. Unemployed capital as well as unemployed human beings. So we're going to enter into this situation. We're going to toss in. Something's going to wipe out up to 50% of the jobs, if not more, including many middle class and well-paid jobs in the economy. Yikes. That looks like a recipe for disaster. Now, the problem is aggravated by the fact that we argue that it's a political crisis and it requires a political solution. We're not going to go from here to 2046 and no jobs or 10% of jobs uh, and it's just going to happen. It's going to be a process that's going to be intensely political. And what happens in this intervening three decades will determine what sort of world we're in at the end of the process. And that's completely up for grabs. And that's really what we were interested in the book, understanding that process, the sort of political solutions we're going to need and what we're going to have to do in view of the fact that our own political system right now is, you know, extraordinarily corrupt and uh, useless as far as serving the interests of the people of this country at this stage of the game. Now our argument, when we start working on the book, and this, this is where John's introduction is appropriate, you know, we looked at the historical evidence, we looked at the 1930s, the last period of massive unemployment, 
We said, how did uh, capitalists and democratic nations respond to massive unemployment in the past? Maybe get some guidance historically for what trends we ought to see emerging here. And we argued the two likely things we'll see develop, not only in the United States, but worldwide, will be on one hand the emergence of democratic socialism as a response to a failing capitalism and unemployment. On the other hand, we said bluntly, history makes it real clear, when you have mass unemployment, you're going to see fascism. That is almost a certainty. And our editor, uh, when we first wrote this, she read it like last August or September in the draft. She wrote back and said, you can't put stuff like this in a book for Americans. Democratic socialism, fascism, these terms mean nothing in the United States. They're going to think you're a flipped off your rocker. We said, look, believe me, this is a long-term book. We're looking over decades. This is where the historical evidence takes us. So this, we have to be true to the evidence. And she, she wanted us to take it out of the book. Um, uh, she said, and then she said, okay, she relented. Then a few months later, <laughs> you can imagine the triumphant phone call from our end that we got from her. <laughs> so she said, you, know, you guys might be on to something with this, uh, <laughs> what you're writing in this book. Uh, in fact, as, as John pointed out, there's a, you'll find a lot of overlap to Bernie Sanders' arguments and critique. But I think also, as John pointed out, much of the book is stuff Bernie's not talking about yet, uh, and no politicians are talking about yet, uh, and everyone's going to be talking about soon. Uh, actually, I've seen a few references to this in, uh, briefly uh, in a few speeches by politicians, but only as a throwaway clause in the sentence. It's not even a whole sentence yet. Uh, when they talk about automation and robotics and artificial intelligence. So what's happening and why is it happening? Well, the basic, the research shows that probably 50% of existing jobs will be uh, gone in this next 10, 20, 30 years. So a lot of people say in the next 10 years. Uh, and this, this isn't hypothetical, it's already coming along. Uh, we're seeing part of it. Uh, at the same, and the reason, you know, to get some sense of how severe this is and how close it is to fruition, one of the largest companies in the world, a German industrial company, which I can only not name because it said at a private dinner, uh, had a, the CEO of this company, it's one of the 25 largest corporations in the world, has hundreds of manufacturing plants in the world, had a dinner for the elite of Germany, and a friend of mine, a friend of John's too, was at this dinner, uh, and was a witness to it, and he said the CEO of this company was asked in the Q&A period, what about this stuff about automation? Is that for real? Are there really going to be robots in your factories? And he said, uh, yes, not only is it for real, we could automate all our factories right now and make them save money. He said, the only reason we can't do it right now in Germany is political, because if we were to do that, the middle class would burn. That was his, that was his quote. I'm translated from German. The middle class would burn. And uh, American corporations, as you know, don't quite have that same guilt complex about the middle class of this country. I don't think they're going to have the qualms that the German CEO uh, had. So why, you know, why, what, what is, how do we best understand this? And the, the thing that strikes us as we did the research on this is how difficult it is to get your head around the growth in computer power and the breakthroughs that have come. Uh, the DARPA, the Defense Advanced uh, Research Project that works out of the Pentagon, which really led much of the research on the internet and the digital revolution, a little over a decade ago launched a specific project in robotics with a very large budget to encourage advanced robotics, uh, artificial intelligence. And the guy who ran it, a guy named Gil Pratt, left heading that project last year and he wrote an article for an academic journal where he started to describe the breakthroughs they'd made and what we could expect coming down the pipe. And what Pratt argued was that the only way we, humanity can understand what we're about to enter, what the period we're going to go to in the next generation or so, uh, the term he used is we're going to have a Cambrian explosion. Now, I didn't know what that meant. I thought it was an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Or so I would be talking about an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. So I looked it up. And I found out the Cambrian explosion refers to a period 540 million years ago, about a 20 million year period when life, which for a billion years had been piddling along a single cell and not doing much, exploded. And all the diversity of life we know today in a 20 or 30 million year period came along and led to everything what we have today, what we're losing today. Uh, so it changed everything. So that was his way of saying we're about to go into a world we can't even begin to understand anymore than some one cell amoeba could have understood what was going to hit uh, 540 million years ago. 
The one thing he said that will, he said, one thing we can safely predict is this. Most jobs are toast. Most, that's because there's going to be so much money to be saved by businesses with this technology. There's absolutely no reason to employ humans. That will become widespread. That's in our economy. He didn't call it, he just assumed our economy. That's unavoidable. And in our book, we go through the history of automation, which really comes right with uh, the birth of computers in the Second World War, the, digital, the beginning of digital communication. And we trace that. And what's striking is that at the very beginning, I mean, literally within a year of the first computer, Fortune magazine is running a cover story on will there be jobless factories in the future. It was instantly understood the digital revolution was different from all other technological revolutions because it could do artificial intelligence eventually. Uh, and they understood that once that happens, then all sorts of stuff humans do could be replaced by machines. Uh, and by the 1960s, it's an intensely uh, controversial issue. There, there probably is more attention to automation in the 1960s than any other period in American history. There were presidential commissions, congressional hearings, best-selling books about it. There was a tremendous fear that all jobs were going to be wiped out, all jobs, by robots and machines. Now, today, when you read that, and you look at the computers they're scared of, which are so laughably primitive, it seems absurd. What are these guys worried about? I mean, like the cell phone here, probably to recreate that computer power in 1964 would have taken this entire building. You know, the, the idea that that was gonna replace uh, human labor is absurd. But the thing that's happened since the 1960s that makes it real now, uh, it's something you're, I'm sure you're probably most of you familiar with called Moore's Law, which is the computer power doubles every year and a half or two years. So there's debate over that. It's not really a law, it's just basically an observation of the growth of computer power. And you know, if you double something uh, every year and a half, the first 10 or 15 years didn't seem that remarkable. Two to the second, two to the third, two to the fourth, two, four, eight, 16, 32. You, know, you get up to 10.48, and you know, it sort of gets interesting then, you're a thousand times greater after uh, 15 years. But when you get up to like 2 to the 28th power, which is sort of like where we are now, then you're getting to some silly numbers, like quadrillions, and you're doubling them every year and a half. Now, there's some talk that Moore's Law is ending or slowed down because you can only speed it up so much. But even if it is slowing down, even if it's ending, there are other improvements to be made, but we're so far uh, past where we were, the, the speed and power of computing is so phenomenal today that a lot is possible, like the stuff that was talked about that makes the new Cambrian explosion. Mm -hmm. It gives some sense how much stronger computers are today compared to 1971. Uh, if automobiles, speed of automobiles increased since 1971 as much as the power of computers, the fastest automobile in the world today would be able to go one-tenth the speed of light. <laughs> one-tenth the speed of light. Yeah. If building skyscrapers grew as tall uh, since 1971 as computers increased in strength, the tallest building in the world would reach halfway to the moon. So that's just some graphic sense of what, what we've gotten ourselves into. And I think, you know, now something like driverless cars, which we all know about, um, that's not even cutting edge technology anymore. That, that's just sort of fine tuning it and dealing with the political issues that come with getting it in play. The technology there, that's, that's really several years old. There's, there's patching it up right now. Uh, and driverless cars is a good place to understand what we're looking at. Because driverless cars, in one hand, would be phenomenal if you think about it. You could have a, everyone sharing cars. It would be great for the environment. It would be great for cities not to be clogged up with cars. You use them when you need them. Just call up a driverless car to come get you. Uh, it'd be great for the, you know, you can make a plausible argument that that could be a very good thing in a certain type of world, not the world we live in. Because <laughs> the problem with driverless cars in our economy is the number one job for men in the American economy, by far, is driving a vehicle. A truck, a bus, a delivery vehicle, a van, a taxi, something. Uh, that's the number one job for men in the American economy. And there's really not a number two or number three. There's only also receiving votes at the bottom. So if you, businesses find suddenly you can just wipe that off the blackboard, those millions of jobs. <laughs> that's what that guy in Germany is talking about. The middle class will burn. And that, that's, that's just a political fight right now. That's, that's what we're looking at. That's not a technological down the road utopia or dystopia. That, that's on the immediate horizon. And by that, you can see how this raises fundamental problems for capitalism in a capitalist economy. Because what happens under capitalism, and why this won't go to 2046 without immense political struggles, 
Under capitalism, if you don't have any workers, if you don't have any income, they can't buy anything. Right. And if they can't buy anything, no business, even if they've got the world's greatest robots, has great incentive to build, produce more stuff because no one can buy it. It's really the dilemma of capitalism. And it points out, John and I argue, to the clear need uh, that we've got to come up with a new economy that can take advantage of these technologies and rather than have them, you know, make matters worse, create more inequality and more poverty, impoverish us and lead to more uh, dreadful condition, have them work for us. And we could, it is really a, it's a remarkable moment where we can go transcend where we are or we're going to go backwards. And uh, it's interesting when you look at the history of economic thought, some of our greatest economists have always understood that capitalism sort of had a a shelf life, it depended on their political values or how long they wanted the shelf life to be, but it wasn't it wasn't going to be around forever. It built into it were the seeds of its own destruction. And clearly I think that's what's happening here, what we're seeing. Perhaps the greatest economist of the 20th century was John Maynard Keynes, uh, who wrote the general theory of the prescribed how to understand the depression and get out of it. And Keynes wrote an extraordinary seven-page essay in 1930 called A Letter to My Grandchildren, in which he said the problem with capitalism, this was in 1930 in the Depression, isn't that it's fundamentally weak. The problem is it's fundamentally too strong. It produces more than it can consume. And that's why we have a depression. And he said 100 years from now, it's likely that very few people will have to work at all. And we'll be able to produce enough so everyone can have a quality standard of living. 100 years, he said. And he said, when that happens, it's going to create great trauma in society because the human species has been oriented towards work, material survival, material survival since the beginning. We've always defined it by that. Every society, going right back to being, getting food in your mouth, roof over your head, your labor is the defining thing of, of life. And that's not going to be necessary anymore. <coughs> How we make the transition to a world where that's not necessary, where the economic problem is solved, will be the great issue 100 years from now, he said. And then I read this, and I've read that essay several times, the last time I read it for this book, we see 2030, so you're going, wow, this guy was really smart. I <laughs> <laughs> really nailed that one. I mean, he must have been good at the stock market. I think he was. But, um, what should replace it? How, what, should we, what, what do we need to do? Well, John and I don't offer an alternative economy. Uh, but what we do argue is that the crucial thing we need to do is build out and strengthen democratic institutions mm -hmm. and then have democratic experimentation, debate, discussion, come up with alternative economies that work for people at the local, state, national, and international level. And here's where much of our book uh, is centered, looking at what we call how do you make a credible democracy? Understanding right now that the United States democracy uh, is really pathetic by any international or historical standards. It's, it's really, democracy is a very loose use of the term. Uh, as former President Jimmy Carter said uh, behind closed doors to some German visitors uh, three years ago, the United States is no longer a functional democracy. Or as a certain presidential candidate, many of you were wearing shirts and buttons for, <laughs> said actually at our book launch party yeah. for our last book, Dollarocracy, to which he wrote the introduction, he said, after 25 years in Washington, I can tell you, not, no decision is ever made by the U.S. Congress that is not uh, signed, sealed, and delivered by corporate America. If it goes against their interests, it cannot get through. Uh, Senator Sanders, for those of you who <laughs> came to the United States after two <laughs> years in you know, East Timor or someplace. Uh, and so our argument is we have the solution to a faulty economy uh, and, the, and the, with the crisis that's coming is to strengthen democratic institutions and build out what we call the democratic infrastructure to make it uh, to make it so that you have all the things that make being a citizen possible, that make it possible for you to be equals politically and, and deal with the world. What, is, what does that entail exactly? Well, we think things like having uh, less inequality is central to having a functional democracy. Too much inequality makes democracy impossible. Too much militarism is a known cancer to democracy. Uh, having people educated is necessary, so free education, progressive income taxation, absolutely checks on corruption. Uh, it's utterly central that those be in place. Uh, of course, something we don't have in this country barely at all anymore. Uh, but a credible news media. Uh, yeah, I know, that's all I, that's all I have to say now. It's like a, a punchline. I don't have to write books anymore. It's a credible news media. People start cranking out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and what we do in the book is we try to look at, going back to the beginning of the United States, 
And all the great political battles over the democratic infrastructure, making this a more democratic country where realistically people at the bottom can play an effective role participating in governance. And there's a really rich history on this throughout America, right back to the founding of the country. Extraordinary history. We try to go through some of it, especially as it pertains to the Constitution. Because constitutions are oftentimes where countries sort of lay out the ground rules for how they want power to be conducted and under what terms. And uh, so, what we found in there is that the United States was not a very democratic country for much of its early history. In fact, not at all. Uh, and we became a more democratic country, especially in the 20th century. Uh, the first seven decades of the 20th century, tremendous democratic advances to make it a less corrupt society, a more egalitarian society, a better society. And far from perfect, as we talk about. In fact, yeah, that's a big part of the book. But nonetheless, the democratic infrastructure was strong and powerful. Things like free higher education. It wasn't exactly the case. It was in California and the city of New York. But when I went to a public university in 1973, I think it was $115 a quarter for a really good university. And, you know, I mean, so, so you could actually, you didn't have to, you know, go into debt, not to go to school. In the book, though, there are two periods we're really interested in. And we spend a lot of time on, well, there are a lot of periods actually we're really interested in. John and I love history. But two that I think are pertinent to what I've been talking about right now. The first one is going back to the 1930s and 1940s, the Great Depression and Second World War. And why this is important to us is that President Franklin Roosevelt, who was the president during the Second World War, we went back and looked at what he was doing in the Second World War, along with his vice president for his third term, Henry Wallace. What became clear is that both of them, independently and lesser so together, uh, were really obsessed with uh, making sure that when the Second World War was won, that fascism would never return to the planet again. Because they understood if fascism came back with some of the weapons they were working on, that could be the end of our species. Uh, so it really was not an option to let fascism ever return. And uh, FDR argued that the, the, ground, the things that created fascism was uh, corrupt, ineffectual governance, uh, too much monopoly power in the economy uh, that sort of corrupted the governing process and mass unemployment. And you put those three things together and you allow them to exist and you're, it's the breeding ground uh, of fascism. And so in 1944, in one of the most extraordinary speeches in American history, he gave the State of the Union address. And uh, you can see that actually, I saw it on YouTube after reading about it for years, just recently. It's, you can go YouTube, FDR's 1944 City of the Universe. It's well worth watching. It's him giving the radio address, the film of him giving it. And uh, he said in that address, he said, you know, we're going to beat, we're going to win this war. And when we do, we have to make sure fascism is eliminated, not only in Germany and Japan, but here. It's a threat to come to this country, too. He was definitely concerned about fascism in this country. And he said, what we need to do to make sure that doesn't happen is we have to have an economic bill of rights added to the Constitution to take into account the modern times, or a second bill of rights. And this included the right to a job at a living wage, the right to health care, the right to health care, the right to education, the right to housing. is something you, you have as an inalienable right, just like the right to speech or worship an inalienable right. And he said, if we do this, we'll be so strong a, a nation, democratically, that no matter what problem comes along, we will not have to worry about fascism. We will solve that problem. Uh, he died shortly thereafter, regrettably, and it never really got off the ground. But to give some sense of the imagination FDR had about this, this they took one little itty bitty piece of what he talked about in the Second Bill of Rights, and they, that was the one piece that got adopted, and that's considered one of the half dozen most important legislative accomplishments of the middle of the 20th century, which is the GI Bill. And that was just a little bit taken from the Second Bill of Rights, uh, which gave returning soldiers all sorts of uh, uh, support, going to school, starting businesses, buying houses, and to some was significant for building out the middle class of the country, for people like John and my parents, and probably some of your parents, and grandparents, and great-grandparents. <laughs> Uh, so, what's interesting though is even though it died in the United States and it never was taken up to be added to the Constitution or even passed in legislation form, uh, it became the basis for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that Eleanor Roosevelt championed, which the UN is accepted by most nations of the world. And that is actually a treaty that's adopted worldwide, it's from FDR's second uh, State of the Union address. And it also, interestingly enough, you know, back in 1945, most people in the United States and most people in the world thought Germany and Japan were hopelessly 
screwed up places that could never have a democracy, they could never be at peace, they were war-loving freaks who were incapable of democratic governance. That was, a, well, at 1945, you could understand why. <laughs> Uh, and what's interesting is the United States literally wrote the Japanese Constitution when we occupied it in 1945 under Douglas MacArthur in 1946. And we had a heavy thumbprint on the German Constitution written at the same time. And both of them include significant chunks of the Second Bill of Rights, FDR's Second Bill of Rights, which is sort of interesting uh, if you look at their constitutions. Why it's interesting is this. The Economist magazine every year has something called the Democracy Index where it ranks all the countries in the world and how democratic they are. And it uses conventional political science stuff, you know, freedom, voter participation, amount of corruption, ease to get involved in the process. Uh, it's not really controversial in most of their entries. In the two countries that stand atop it in recent years, every year, for all the nations with at least 50 million population, so we're throwing Norway up, back in the water. But of all the nations at the top, the two countries at the top, that are the 30 or so countries in the world, 50 million population, Germany and Japan. The, the helpless basket cases with FDR's constitution. Um, and then on that left, point two, in 1960s, Martin Luther King with A. Philip Randolph uh, developed the freedom budget, a vision for how to redo the United States to make it a more moral uh, society. And it was lifted large chunks of it directly from FDR's 1944 State of the Union address. I mean, it was taken uh, virtually letter. And then to, to go to our friend, Mr. Sanders, uh, in November, when he gave the speech on what is democratic socialism at Georgetown University, if you saw that speech, you're one of the four people who was able to see it uh, on television <laughs> since it was you know, broadcast in the Sotho Network or something. Uh, his speech was basically predicated on FDR's 1944 State of the Union Address and Martin Luther King's Freedom Budget. That's when he said, this is my vision. So there's a long-standing tradition, a rich one, we can draw from as we try to think, rethink democracy in this country and what sort of country we want to have. Now, the second period we look at, and I'll just say a couple lines about this, it's a big part of the book, is the 1960s, when there was that automation hysteria. Because this is the really interesting period, because at that time, there was a lot of public debate, a lot of talks like this, but many more, about what it would be like to have this radical tech, to get rid of a post-scarcity society, society in which people didn't have to work. And it wasn't just fear, oh God, it's gonna be horrible, there's a lot of that. But there's also like, wow, this could be fantastic. We can just clean the environment, build great cities. People could do really interesting things with their lives. Working class people could have the lives of those rich people, all poets and artists and filmmakers. You know, they could do interesting stuff like them now for the first time ever. Uh, and I think it's a rich history there that's been ridiculed or forgotten that we should not ridicule or forget. It, it is a lot to teach us about how we can imagine the future in a much more positive and progressive and democratic way. But to get there is going to require phenomenal political activism, uh, political genius, strategy and tactics, maybe a little bit of luck. And there's one person in this country, I talk, when I want to know something about how to get somewhere politically, what to do, put it in historical context, and what's the lay of the land is, that's the guy I look to. <laughs> <laughs> Always, he's been excited to you now. All right, Brian.